you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Hello everybody, today we're talking about one of the increasingly few cars out there that are languishing in the classifieds at relatively affordable prices that I think deserve to be worth maybe a little bit more the BMW Z3. This is the second video I'm filming today on this car. The first was about the recommissioning process the car has just undergone. We've had all the mechanicals and cosmetic bits sorted and the car is going off in a couple of days to Providence Cars who are going to be selling it for me. Don't worry, this is not a sales pitch. If I'm lucky, by the time you see this video, the car will actually already be gone. So, the Z3 then. It was BMW's first attempt at mass manufacturing a sporty convertible, but it wasn't their first attempt full stop. Previous to this, you had the gorgeous BMW 507, which though it was very, very easy on the eye, perhaps one of the prettiest cars to ever come from Germany, didn't sell at all. BMW then waited a few decades before trying again with the rather out there and avant-garde Z1. That's the one where the doors just drop into the sill. That's actually a rather magnificent thing and unfortunately with that BMW expected nobody to want to buy it. Uh, but it turns out that everybody did. BMW then hurried to try and build a lot more than they originally intended, but the moulds quite literally fell apart. So production of those stopped at just eight thousand. This was a car they always intended to build a few more of, and it turns out they did. It wasn't like BMW seemed to be in any hurry to introduce another sports car though. Production on the Z1 ended in 1991 after a two-year run, and this wasn't released until around 1995, debuting for many in the James Bond film Goldeneye, easily the best Bond film of the modern era. And when all was said and done in 2002, nearly 300,000 of these had found a home. What is particularly baffling about the Z3 though is despite BMW being famed for their straight six engines, when the car launched, they didn't actually offer one. In fact, you couldn't have a straight six powered Z3 until 1997. Over the car's run, a number of different engines were available in both four and six cylinder, including, confusingly, 1.8, 1.9, a two litre, which was a six cylinder, a 2.2, which was a four, a 2.3, which was a six, a 2.5, which was a six, a 2.8, a three, and a 3.2. Two. Not all of those engines were available in all markets or at all times, with some superseding others. Of course, 25 years later, when they're all mixed up together in a bucket with all of the other Z3s, it can be a little bit hard to tell them apart. The engines you're going to need to know about here in the UK are the 1.9, the 2.2, the 2.8 and the 3 litre. We did get the 2 litre, but for a very, very short period of time, in fact only one year I believe, and the 3.2 was the domain of the M cars, so that's not really something we're going to worry about too much today. If you must have a four-cylinder in your Z3, get yourself one of the later 2.2s. The car was introduced with a 1.9-litre engine, which here in the UK was available only as a 16-valve unit, making 140 horsepower. Elsewhere it was available as an 8 There's a guy locally with a Murcielago. He's just spent 50 quid. 60 quid. Good lad. Anyway, elsewhere you could get an 8-valve version of the 1.9-litre engine, which made even less power, around 120 horses. And in case you're wondering, no, that isn't really enough to carry this car around. Underneath you have essentially an E36. More accurately, it's an E36 compact though. At the front it's very much the same car as your regular E36, but like the compact at the back, you in fact have the semi-trailing arm rear suspension from the old E30. Construction is also all steel, meaning it's not an especially light car. Even the most trim of Z3s was a few hundred kilos more than the equivalent MX-5. In any case, a simple power deficit isn't really the biggest problem of the four pots. You see, if BMW can make anything, it's a six. 
everything else, historically, they do rather struggle with. And I've had the four-cylinder that they offered in this in another car. It was terrible. My memory tells me that the 16 valve was actually less reliable than the 8, although my recent research tells me I've got that the wrong way around. I'm sure the internet will be able to correct me either way. But these days, only about a thousand to two thousand pounds more over a 1.9 will get you into a 2.8, and only a few thousand pounds more than that will get you into one of these, which is the last of line three litre. Even the 2.8, though, has quite a few things going for it. Naturally, power output is healthier. 190 horsepower in the 6-pot versus the 140 you got in the 1.9, and in the 3-litre you got another 40 horsepower, bringing it up to 231. You also got, as standard, a limited slip differential at the back, and for the early cars you also got a wider rear too where the four cylinders did not. Later on, this body style became standard, but for the early cars, it did make the 2.8 stand out. And it's something you don't tend to see manufacturers do much now for what would still be the cooking model. The funny thing about the Z3 is that the version most people now remember is the one that nobody wanted to buy when new. The Honey I Shrunk the FF If You're Feeling Unkind Clown Shoe Looking M Coupe. People also now forget that they did do a coupe version of the regular car, but I'm not sure they actually sold it, or certainly didn't sell very many, here in the UK. Elsewhere, I think they did a lot better, whereas here we seem to just get the M variants. I certainly can't recall seeing a non-M Z3 coupe on the roads here. Again, someone correct me if I'm wrong. What is interesting about the M, though, is that the engines were quite different. Here you first got the S50 B32 lump, the 3.2 litre engine you got in the E36 M3. This then morphed into the S54 powered 320 horsepower Z3, the most potent engine the model ever got. In America though, things weren't always this way, because it started with the S52, an engine variant designed explicitly for North American customers with a lot less power. Here we got around 300 horses, there they only got 240. The later cars though got more or less the same engine and power as we did, with only a few horses between them. So if you're over stateside or in Canada, a later Z3M is definitely the one to buy. Back though to the regular car, and for me, the 2.8 or 3 litre would be the only engines I'd ever consider. Which is a shame, because there's currently a velvet blue 2.2 litre up for sale that looks magnificent. However, with these cars, you will get that classic BMW creamy smooth soundtrack. You'll get fantastic durability. Both engines easily capable of doing 200,000 miles with just regular maintenance. Yes, they have a couple of failure points, including the water pump, particularly for the later engines, but they're so well known now that really you don't need to worry about them. They're also pretty decent on fuel, with the 3 litre actually being marginally better. Both will achieve around the 29 to the gallon mark as an average, which for this kind of engine I think is actually pretty decent. Pricing aside, the only thing that might make you choose between the 2.8 or the 3 litre is the fact that the 3 litre was available only with the facelift body style. That brought many improvements both outside and in, and for me it is the car that I would want. The 2.8 is still a decent looking car, but I don't think quite as nice as the later one. These also, being an older car that were cheaper for just that little bit longer, have I think a higher likelihood of being examples which need perhaps a little bit more TLC now to bring them up to scratch. The Z3 also came with a choice of gearboxes, but if you do want an automatic I'd recommend getting a later car, because those were a 5-speed versus the earlier 4. The manual was always a 5-speed, regardless of what you chose, and if you wanted an M that was the only gearbox option available. Confusingly though, there were still two different 5-speed manual boxes available. If you got a 2.8, a 3 or the M, you got a ZF, but if you bought a 2.5 or below, you got a Gatrag. The good news is, both of them are pretty nice to use.
you would think that the idea of a sporty BMW driven by none other than James Bond would be an instant hit. Although it's true that the Z3 certainly found customers, the reception it got from the motoring press never seemed quite as warm, for a few different reasons. First off, that suspension layout. It was old at the time and rather unbecoming a proper sports car, which is what BMW said this was. The MX-5 had the much more traditional and, I think, better double wishbone front and rear. This also had not really any more power than the MX-5, but was a more expensive car. I have a copy of Autocar from 1996, and in that, they don't even make mention of the Z3. But I have a slightly later edition from 2000, when this was still in production and the second generation MX-5 was on sale. And the most expensive MX-5 is still cheaper than the least expensive Z3, which at the time was actually the newly introduced 1.8. About £800 separated the two, but if you wanted the top spec 3 litre car, you'd be paying nearly £30,000. And if you wanted an M, you'd be paying forty grand, which was actually about the same as an entry level 7 series was back then. The Porsche Boxster also arrived about five minutes after the Z3 and rather stole its thunder, because as a sports car, it was a lot better. Even worse than that, you can't play the typical BMW card of superior German build quality, because this car was assembled in a place called Spartanburg. It might sound very German, and I've got 20 quid riding on the fact it was chosen for that exact reason, but Spartanburg you will not find in Germany, it's in South Carolina. Don't think though that this is all bad news for the BMW, because there's a lot to like about it. The interior is fairly cramped, I'm 5'10 and I just about fit, I don't think it's really any more generous in here than an S2000 or even the MX-5, but everything you touch still works. It feels reasonably high quality, if very 1990s slash 1980s in parts. The E36 clearly donated a lot of parts to this interior, but I don't think it really suffers for it. And with this particular car, the extended leather to the dash and door cards really does lift it. I quite like these seats, although they're not anywhere near as supportive as you might think. The Oregon leather is also... Um, a choice. It's easily identifiable by the sort of um, dimples, I guess you might call them, on there, and it's a very, very old school BMW thing. Don't think I go with it now, but it's a look, I suppose. For Doug fans, my favourite part of this interior is the trip computer, which is down here, cleverly disguised as the clock. And you operate it not with the buttons below it, which might have something to do with it, but instead from the stalk up here. I spent 10 minutes looking at this, working out where the trip computer was. Go. Oh. And although the four cylinders had neither the power nor the character to make up for the weight deficit over an equivalent MX-5, the straight six does. That is the engine this car was always meant to have, and it's got something over its Porsche rival too. It actually works. Not only are these wonderfully characterful, but the straight six of this generation is one of the most durable production car engines ever made. About the opposite could be said of the Porsche six-cylinder, which in that era was certainly very entertaining and made a great noise, probably a better sports car engine than this, but they have gained a reputation for fragility that is going to follow them forevermore. In fact, a 986 Boxster, both then and now, commands a lot more money than one of these, up to double, I would say, for an equivalent car. Yet they are going to cost an awful lot more to run, whether they break or not. And they will. Actually, not only do these feel more premium than the equivalent MX-5, they rust far less too. They even seem to have fewer creaks and rattles than the equivalent Mercedes SLK. That's to say nothing of the TVR of the time, which still would have been a rival for this, and they've a much, much lower bulk factor than the Boxster. So what about the Z3 then? Makes it a car that people just don't seem that keen on. Is it the way that it drives? Happily, no. So here's the thing about the Z3, at least this one anyway. There are plenty of cars out there which are simply nice things to be in, but not especially great to drive. 
There are then other cars which are fantastic to drive fast, but otherwise they're not so enjoyable. And then you get cars like this, which is simply very enjoyable to drive. And it's here where I tend to find myself divorcing my opinion from that of the traditional motoring press. Believe it or not, I am often criticised for the fact that my reviews involve driving a road car on the roads at road speeds. I don't know quite why it is that people think that's somehow an inappropriate test of cars which are going to be used in exactly that scenario, but according to some, power sliding through your own private test track is a far more real-world evaluation of any motor vehicle. On a piece of road such as this, which is one of my more technical, narrow and demanding sections that I use, a Boxster would certainly be doing better. The S2000 is perfectly suited to this kind of thing, and this is probably the exact kind of road that shows all of the Z3's weaknesses. The most obvious is scuttle shake. In most scenarios, you don't notice it too much, but if the road surface isn't particularly cooperative, the chassis does move around a fair bit. Luckily, there's quite a bit to make up for that. First off, that engine. Absolutely no escaping the fact it is the star of the show. And for me, I think the superior power plant to certainly the regular Boxster's engine, if not maybe the S, it has ample torque and pulls comfortably throughout the entire rev range. It seems almost impossible to catch this thing off guard. It does pull perhaps slightly harder in the top 2000 RPM, but it's not even close to an M engine, a Porsche and a mile away from that in the S2000. The difference between those two cars though is that the S2000 is one of those cars that you really do need to want to get out there and drive it. If you want to get the best from it, you have to wring its neck. Very often, I simply don't bother, and it is true that that's a car you can still enjoy without having to engage VTEC, but it then seems like you're rather missing the point. With a car like this, you can simply trundle along and enjoy the unusually clement British winter sun, and you don't feel like you've really missed anything. Perhaps most impressive is that that engine actually has a really rather nice note. As far as I am aware, the exhaust on this car is completely standard, with it being a one-owner item. If he changed it, I think I would know. But at low speeds, when you lift off, you get this most wonderful and delicious burble, and the occasional pop too. Allow me to demonstrate. I don't know quite how well this is coming through on the microphone, but it's actually really rather pleasant. The volume is perfectly judged. You've got this gorgeous, creamy, smooth six-cylinder soundtrack accompanying you at all times, but it's never really intrusive or invasive. This car has the optional wind deflector fitted, and I think it does make a bit of a difference. In the cabin, it's not actually that bad. It is quite cramped though, with the roof up, this does feel a little bit claustrophobic, roof down and the car is transformed. This really is one of those cars where you just don't want to drive it, roof up. It feels naturally much lighter and airier, of course it would, there's no roof on the thing. But more than that, you've got this huge amount of glass here, this quarter is absolutely enormous and makes you feel like you could run your hand along the road like you can in a caterham. By modern standards, this isn't a particularly big car, which means it's quite nice to place, and you've got a rather nice view at the front too. That bonnet's got a very pronounced bulge in the middle, which has whiffs of E-type Jaguar, or even Ferrari 550 about it. The pedals are actually surprisingly close together too. They're not narrow-body caterham bad, but if you've got particularly large feet, it's actually worthwhile making sure you fit comfortably. You may need to invest in some narrow footwear. With my Pilotis or my Lonsdales on, it's absolutely fine. But I've currently got my Pumas on, as I thought there wouldn't really be a problem. And the pedal box is actually quite narrow. Now I've got a little bit of clear road, let me put my foot down so you can listen to that engine. With 
the wheels refurbished and the new tyres on, the steering wobble mercifully has been cured. Even better though, what remains is actually a rather pleasant helm. It's not quite as interactive or as feelsome as the one you'd find in, say, a 944 or a 968, but it's got a really pleasant weighting about it, communicates overall grip levels quite well, and the speed of it is nicely judged too. That's one of the few differences made to this car over the 3 Series on which it is based. It has a slightly quicker steering rack, 2.7 turns, lock to lock. The turning circle is actually not that bad, which is a common benefit of rear-wheel drive cars, although boot space has suffered a little bit. I'm told that one of the reasons behind using the slightly less sophisticated rear suspension from an E30 was to try and preserve a little bit of storage in the car. I suppose it worked because the car does have some room in it, although you'd hardly call it capacious. The car even has three glove boxes. You have one in the traditional place and then two here, albeit one does feel a little bit like an ashtray. The roof mechanism is really quite frustrating. It's not the simple affair you'd find in a box store where you do one click, push a button and you're done. Instead what you do is you have to pull the sun visors down, pull a lever out here, then manually push it up a little bit, then you've got to put your foot on the brake, fiddle down here for a switch which is in the most awkward of places because they expect you to have your foot on the brake so they know you're going to be sitting here then you can't actually see this button back here and then you've got to hold that down and the roof will retract and then it doesn't tell you when it's actually done you've just got to sort of wait and then make your best guess it, it's reasonably obvious but why they couldn't put a little beep or a confirmation light or something in to tell you the roof is down i don't know the brake pedal has a nice feel, there is some travel in it, it's not overly servoed, and all of the controls in here have a little bit of weight to them, but not so much that I think anyone would have issues with driving it. Truth be told, as soon as I knew I was going to be getting this car in, I had plans to sell it, because I already have the S2000, I already have a sporty convertible, and the theory is, not that I tend to follow it that often, all of the cars I get in, I like to do something different to one another. The truth is that the Z3 actually does feel distinct enough from the S2000 that I think you could have both and not feel like you've got too much crossover. It certainly doesn't feel like you're sat in a lesser car though. While I appreciate the mythos and the legend surrounding the S2000, the fact is this is a perfectly decent car and right about now an example of an S2000 is going to cost you roughly twice as much as it would to get in a decent one of these. Prices of the Z3 start from still a couple of grand, but a good Z3 you can get from about five or six, whereas the bottom of the S2000 market is about eight to ten. A bigger, torquier engine and reasonably long gearing also mean that I think this is a car a little bit more comfortable on the motorway. Before our conclusion, let's have another quick blast, shall we? These tyres are actually a really perfect partner for this car. They've got very, very few miles on them, so may still be scrubbing in. They tell me modern tyres don't do that now, but I swear some of them do. In any case, this car's got quite a bit of pitch and roll in it. It makes it actually quite enjoyable, and it's that that communicates its ability level to you. You can tell that when the car's really, really dug in and reached its limit, that's when the tyres actually start to protest. And reasonably so, because I expect, in some corners, it's actually putting quite a bit of weight onto them. Heel and toe, absolutely delightful, as you can probably tell. The car moves with you, you've got that mechanical limited slip differential at the back as well, which means you can have a little bit of fun should the mood take you. And this one even has DSC as well. Earlier cars had either no or very limited traction control. This is a little bit better, but I still wouldn't put too much faith into it. The best thing really about this car is that you do sit reasonably high, but that's a function of the rest of the car being so low. You don't feel like you're up high. It just seems as if the car has kind of melted away from you. You don't really get that these days in front engine cars. There's a whole plethora of regulations that mean it's just impossible. But this came from an era when it still could happen. And as a result, you kind of just forget the car. And like the best sports cars, it just melts away underneath you. 
leaving you with simply a fine engine, a decent cooperative gearbox, a well-weighted set of controls, and a chassis that's competent, playful when it needs to be, but also has just enough about it that you can drive the hell out of it and still be doing modest speeds, yet it doesn't feel frustrating. Very, very difficult balance to strike. I'm sure plenty of people out here would find that this car is simply too slow, too low a grip level. There's a lot you could actually do. I haven't even fitted super wide tires to this. I've kept the original reasonably narrow items. But I'm pretty certain this is one of many examples where trying to make a car faster just wouldn't make it better. Simple as that. As it happens, my favorite thing about this car is driving it at 20 mile an hour, because then I can listen to that exhaust. That then is a little bit on this 2000 BMW Z3 3 litre Roadster. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you're interested in buying this car or one like it, because by the time this video is out, it'll probably be gone, check out Provenance Cars. For now though, thanks for watching. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.